currently a doctoral fellow at the University of Western Australia, but the work I'm about to share uh, predates or is unrelated to my PhD research since that research take, takes place almost exclusively in a lab. So most of the projects we'll talk about today take place within or are concerned with existing ruderal ecologies in Canada. Um, and my understanding of the ruderal extends, of course, not just to plants, but also to the microbes and the more than human animals that exist within those ecologies within an interconnected web. So our contemporary human relationship with non-humans, you know, including animals and microbes, particularly wild ones, uh, are marked with intense political and cultural meaning. Um, wildlife species are considered, interacted with, and managed in post-colonial Western capitalist society uh, through the lens of our two-legged xenophobia. And this is a common instance of othering, which is a useful estrangement uh, that allows for the prioritization of human interests. So this is the one, one of the conditions that emerges very strongly uh, in my work and especially through the first project that I'll share. So first I'm going to talk about this Canadian site of toxic industrial dumping habitat fragmentation and the influx of hormone-like pollution that often characterizes human interventions into sensitive animal realities. Now this project took place in New Brunswick, Canada in a community ecology of complex colonial circumstances. So you have the historically infamous uh, Canadian Forces Base Gage Town, which is kind of off the map here, but I'll show you in a moment. Uh, that was established in 1958. This buttresses Elm Hill, uh, which is one of the earliest black settlements in Canada, established in 1806. And this whole landscape is on traditional uh, Willistically indigenous territory. So Elm Hill, uh, which you see the red pin, um, recedes amongst tree lot monocultures in a pastoral landscape. And it's now a site of very significant economic downturn uh, and very scant populace versus, versus the thriving community that it once was. And Elm Hill traverses a single dirt road here, um, which meets a bumpy back road uh, here off of rural route 102, which is this. Uh, so this is the ecology that I'm talking about. Um, so this obscure crossroads right here where you see the, the blue marker uh, is where I resided temporarily in a tiny locality named McAlpines. And the McAlpines were Scottish loyalists who settled the area in the 1780s. And they were soon after joined by the black loyalists who escaped the US and settled Elm Hill. So the McAlpines property was purchased by a German family in the 70s and they are the ones who planted the monocultures of Eastern white pine. There's an abandoned uh, rodent infested Baptist church and its graveyard where the McAlpine family tombstone declares that their graves are unknown, presumably on the property somewhere. Now, Base Gage Town dominates to the west, beginning at Route 102. Um, now, the 100-year-old farmhouse I rented had been mostly unoccupied for give or take 20 years, and it sits across the road from the church down a long dirt driveway through a monoculture plot. And the only living residents within sight and mostly out of sight include select groups of resilient wildlife. And typically the only human activity within hearing range is that of Base Gage Town. So when I first arrived at the McAlpines, there were daily ballistics exercises that, you know, huge explosions thundering over the landscape that silent, completely silenced uh, the very few birds that were around. So Base Gage Town is the second largest military base in Canada at 1100 square kilometers. Um, its infamy comes from once serving as a secret playground for US military testing of Agent Orange. This is a devastatingly toxic chemical herbicide containing dioxin that was used in the Vietnam War. And dioxin exposure on humans and wildlife includes hormonal disruption, birth defects, stillbirth, along with multiple other life-threatening diseases and conditions. Now, as a New Brunswicker, um, this had an immediate impact on my community and I grew up with kids who were affected by dioxin exposure in utero. So Agent Orange isn't the only chemical present at the base. It's also contaminated with persistent chemical agents or PFAS chemicals. And it's on the radar as part of the Canadian government's 4.5 billion 
contaminated sites action plan. So during the latter part of my stay, uh, the base was shut down for bioremediation and the stillness of the landscape with its inhospitable softwoods uh, became deafening. Songbirds and many wildlife species uh, generally don't thrive in the absence of hardwoods, um, such as in these kinds of softwood pine monocultures. So in this set of you know, colonial capitalist circumstances, who or what thrives? And these difficult factors seem to favor the presence of highly adaptable wildlife, uh, such as Eastern coyote. So Eastern coyotes roam freely in the McAlpines, you know, while black bears are sleeping through the winter, scooping up the critters that scurry amongst the pines, maybe ma mainly snowshoe hares. Um, and after the coyote territories become established and new humans such as myself come along, how might, how might these wild canids respond? So in the interest of understanding the adaptive behavior of coyotes to humans, particularly in these ecologically compromised territories where chemical agents are present, I engaged in a set of experiments to create and use uh, DIY pheromone extracts. And I participated in an online hacking the molecular uh, workshop series that was led by trans hack feminist Mary Magic to learn her protocols. Um, and Mary's workshop series was premised on facilitating gender or greater awareness of the presence and impacts of chemical agents, including xenoestrogens in human and other bodies. So to extract my pheromones using Mary's method, I collected a urine sample during the ovulation phase of my cycle, presuming that the hormone profile would in theory be attractive enough to at least pique uh, coyote curiosity. Now in Mary's method, cigarette filters and silica gel beads are added to a funnel stand to create a filtration and absorption system that pulls biochemicals or hormones from the urine and traps them in the filters. And the filtered fluid is then discarded the filters are rinsed with a solvent to release the hormones. And after the filters were rinsed three times, uh, I double boiled the biochemical solution until eventually I was left with a tiny amount here of potently acrid pheromone concentrate that had turned pink from the dye in the silica beads. And so this hot pink hormone liquid was then diluted in purified water in a sterilized perfume spray bottle. And I spritzed this pheromone perfume on the base of a tree, Eastern white pine, of course, um, and strapped an infrared trail camera to a facing tree, which was Eastern white pine, of course, to monitor the wildlife interactions with the site. And so now I'll play a short video that I created of these interactions, um, which is just a minute and a half long. Now the audio on this video is very subtle. I'm going to continue talking while the video plays. So you hear little snippets of audio. Now the New Brunswick provincial government classifies coyotes as a varmint species with no limit on the number of coyotes that can be bagged through a cheap varmint license. And a varmint by definition is an animal, quote, of a noxious or objectionable kind, kind of like a quote, mischievous boy or child. So coyotes are classified as a nuisance animal as well, uh, an animal that can cause property damage to private landowners. However, what constitutes a nuisance might be subjective and motivated by cultural fear. And property damage might include a family pet that has become a coyote snack. Although more often, uh, pets are harmed by getting into the traps that have been set for coyotes. So the human interaction with coyotes around McAlpines included not only bombardment at base gauge town, but also bullets that were occasionally fired by civilians, which I witnessed as echoes of gunshots on neighboring properties. So I wondered, you know, how, how might hormone disruption by chemicals from the base impair the coyotes' abilities to sense my biochemistry? Would they respond differently to my smell than if they'd been undisturbed by synthetic xenoestrogen bombs? Or would my pheromones be more you know, sensorially explosive? Could they interpret xenoestrogens in my system, sniffing them out like you know, police trained detection canines? What might their response be to increased estro colonization? And that's a word that Mary Magic uses a lot uh, of their territory. So it's gonna play one more time while I finish up talking. Um, so to understand these things, I consulted with three different coyote experts Eric Muntz, who tracked free-range eastern coyotes in the Cape Breton Highlands for Parks Canada, 
Simon Gadbois, who's the director of the Canid, Can Canid and Reptile Behavior and Olfaction Lab at Dalhousie University in Halifax, uh, and Dr. Dr. Mark Beckoff, who's one of the world experts in coyote behavior and Professor Emeritus of Ecology and Evolutionary Bi Biology at the University of Colorado in Boulder. So I learned that resident coyotes will scent mark and they will over pee to clearly ID their territory. Whereas transient coyotes may not over pee on a post, just trying to slide by unnoticed, maybe not, maybe they're looking to join a pack. They may smell a scent that's put out and be curious, but this wouldn't change their territory um, because my, my scent, they'd be curious about it, but it's uncoyote like for them to sort of, you know, veer off from their territory. Uh, however, scent is used heavily by trappers for capture, and if they had a negative experience with traps and people, they will likely remember and may avoid strange scents. There is, however, uh, the possibility of them adapting to the odors when they learn they're not dangerous, and then you have the possibility of a habituation effect, which is a gradual reduction of response over time. And if you do it too often with no consequences, then they stop being scared. And after several encounters, they may even ignore the scent. So one major lesson you know, was, for me was that although my experiments were predicated on a biochemical basis of desire, um, sustained human intervention, even when it's well-meaning, can harm wild species. Um, habituation means that animals no longer sense a threat and then they become nuisances and are subject to injurious control strategies. So on my final night at the McAlpines, I stood in the yard and I howled goodbye, but only the full moon answered back in the dark with its white glowing eye. So next I'm gonna present um, two or three different projects that all took place uh, in 2018 through artist research residencies in Canada and Finland. And the first project that I'm going to share is called Prospective Futures, the Aurelia Project. Um, so I'll briefly introduce this project and then I'll play a nine minute video that I produced about some of the processes I engaged in, as well as the politics and the cultural history surrounding this specific ecology that I worked with. So Prospective Futures was developed as part of the Biota series of events facilitated by IOTA Institute in Halifax through their first ever um, Faculty of Science BioArt residency at St. Mary's University. During the residency, I was hosted by a SMU senior, senior research fellow in environmental science, Dr. Linda Campbell. And the overall project concept centered around the healing and recovery of highly contaminated legacy gold mine tailing sites in Nova Scotia using both native goldenrod plant species and a mesophilic extremophile bacteria species, Cupriobus metallodurans. Um, so I conducted laboratory experimentation towards microbial so soil bioremediation with the Capriovitus met metallodurans, which I brought to the lab. Um, and it, it's a special species that produces mer mercuric reductase, uh, which is an enzyme that can metabolize mercury and render it inert. Um, it also, as a metabolic byproduct, produces 24 microparticles of gold, 24 karat microparticles of gold in environments that contain toxic metals. Um, so I was also mentoring an environmental studies uh, Bachelor of Environmental Science honor student, Brittany Hill. And she, you'll see her in the video, she was co-developing and co-leading a goldenrod ecotoxicology uh, remediation with Linda Campbell. And I wanna mention that this project also consulted on Mi'kmaq lived experiences with ecology and the cultural landscape um, with Nova Scotia Museum's curator of ethnology and Mi'kmaq elder, Roger Lewis. St. Mary's University and these various uh, legacy gold mine tailing sites are on Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq First Nation. And my intention for the project outcome was to make a ritual offering of gold producing microbes to a poison site where settler interest industry has rendered a uh, landscape useless and dangerous. Um, the ritual included, and you'll see this in the video, creating small cloth bundles of contaminated soil, which were then inoculated with the live C. Uh, metallodurans, then burying it at the tailing site as a poetic gesture of microbial bioremediation, decolonization of land through bacterial recolonization, and providing a critical space for dialogue around acts of industrial mining, 
settler indigenous relationships um, and further human, human intervention. Unfortunately, uh, this gesture was not supported by the university in the end uh, for a number of political reasons that I can share after the video. And instead, what you see is a mock gesture that was performed with witnesses on site. And the video I'm about to show features an audio interview with Robin Metcalf, who is the gallery director of the St. Mary's University Art Gallery, and who provides a colonial settler perspective, um, as well as the inclusion of archival audio from the Nova Scotia archives that Roger Lewis directed me to. Um, and what you're looking at here are 3D scanning electron micrographs of the, the C. metallodurans microbial landscapes that I was able to produce. Okay, play. Well, now about his great glue stop, what he had told to his, to his people before he left, before he left to this province, after he had teached them a good many different things, what's to be done to themselves to please the others, and then he told them, my dear good children, now I'm going to north. And I'm going to fix your home. Because your home is distroubled here. Your home is distroubled. You're now be living with white people. Which now they will deal with gold and silver. And years to come, you will, you will deal with the same same thing. My name is Robin Metcalf. I was born in Chester, Nova Scotia, and my um, uh, ancestry on both sides is in Atlantic Canada going back a number of generations, 11 generations on my mother's side. She's Acadian. My father's family are Newfoundlanders who immigrated to Canada from Newfoundland in 1922, I believe. They immigrated to Canada to work in the coal mines in, um, in Glace Bay. The family in Newfoundland had been uh, already involved with mining in various sites around uh, Notre Dame Bay, such as Bay Vert. And the last site in Newfoundland that the family had lived in before immigrating was um, Wabana on Bell Island, which is an iron mining site. And I have visited the, the, the former iron mine there. And then they moved to Glace Bay where they worked in uh, coal mining, uh, which is quite dangerous. The coal there is very high in methane, which means that they have a lot of bumps, as they call them, which are underground explosions. But the Indians then didn't know the color of the gold nor silver. But they had known the name of the two, two different things. My father left Cape Breton in 1947. There was a strike at the time. And my parents had just married a year earlier and were living in a jeep with my newly born sister. Now my father was involved in a number of different types of work, all of which fall under what I, I say they fall under the general rubric of earth moving. He uh, was involved with surveying uh, and construction and selling construction and earth moving equipment and mining. So his involvement with mining was on and off. Well now then, I am going to leave after I showed you everything that I want to show you. Now then, your home will be taken, you all will think that your home will be taken, your province will be taken by those people which are you, you're going to live with them. Father's family were hard rock miners, which means that they weren't the ones who dug the coal itself. They had were a more highly skilled and better paid form of work, which was the essentially the engineering of the mines. So my father grew up in a relatively privileged or well-to-do household. I am going to build your home way up in north, where nobody else can come and and live there but you. If I recall correctly, they may have at one point had two cars, which 
in Glace Bay, people were actually literally starving to death. The family was, was not suffering from the destitution that was general to people in the coal mining. However, the um, uh, community was extremely polarized on class lines. The uh, industrial Cape Breton was occupied by the Canadian Army because the uh, class polarization was such that almost the entire population of industrial Cape Breton was allied with the workers. That includes the police. A third of the Canadian Armed Forces were, as I recall, were dispatched and stationed for several years in industrial Cape Breton to prevent a proletarian insurrection. And your home, what I'm going to make up there, it'll be, it'll be so good, and it'll be, it'll be uh, mountains of gold. My father, as a very young child, remembered uh, seeing members of the Royal Canadian Constabulary galloping their horses and leaping over people's back fences and trampling their gardens. And this is, these are the gardens of people who were literally starving to death. That will be surrounded by your home, and if nobody can get there but yourself. So although his family was not, did not suffer economically the way that um, other miners did, they were definitely uh, ideologically aligned with the workers in that community. So my father came away from that experience with a, with a, sen a strong sense of indignation at social injustice and class exploitation. And that got passed on to us and the family and the children mm -hmm. growing up. So he left in the strike of 47 and worked in a number of surveying jobs, uh, some of them in Ontario, but we were back in Nova Scotia when I was born and the family was living in Chester, Nova Scotia, and the reason we were living in Chester was because of gold mining there. But in years to come, you will formally think, you will formally think, our province is all taken by those pale faces. There has been, back in the 19th century, as I recall, there had been a gold rush of some kind in Nova Scotia. And the veins which are distributed along the external Atlantic coast have gone in and out of economic viability over the years, depending on the price of gold, which is, of course, highly volatile. But that will not be so. I will come and see the fair play. And I will come to see how that you will hold your home and your province. Of course, the province is yours. So at times they've been inactive, at other times they've been active, partly depending on the price of gold and partly uh, probably depending on the technologies of extraction. So one of the effects that this had on me, my family involvement with mining, include awareness of social injustice and class issues and the function of capitalism. Also geology, my father learned a lot of geology. He, he didn't have a university education, my mother did, but my father didn't. But he uh, learned from his father and from his work. My father was an important figure in the uh, mining engineering community in Canada in the 30s and 40s. And I learned some geology from my father and awareness of it. And so therefore, and all the things that he had reference to the to the growth of people, it all come so exact and so truly. My mother was Acadian, so the European ancestry of that line dates in Nova Scotia, what's now Nova Scotia back to around 1632 or thereabouts. There's also intermarriage around that time between the people who became Acadians and the Mi'kmaq, so there's some Mi'kmaq ancestry in there as well. Now the people had reached the white people had reached first from here to Klondike, and they had gone on their mountains and canyons, which they had discovered a lot of gold, nothing, and some other. My mother was strongly involved with craft media, both ceramics and textiles. Mary E. Black was a weaver who was very important, uh, wrote The Key to Weaving, which people sometimes call the, a weaver's bible. And in the mid-1940s, Mary E. Black was working for the Nova Scotia, I believe it was the Department of Education, and had a project to educate, to train women in rural and smaller communities with the intention of uh, developing a household industry in weaving. And she hired young Acadian women uh, to go around the province and teach weaving. My mother was one of those women. And that's how she met my father. Uh, so I owe my existence to Mary E. Black. We, we certainly do believe that she will come and see everything, everything dealt accordingly the truth. 
Uh, my mother would tell me about a bus dropping off in the middle of the night in Marble Mountain in Cape Breton with a suitcase and a portable loom. And it was in uh, when she was in Sydney or Glace Bay that she encountered my father, that they met each other. It is nobody can prevail my words. Okay. Hopefully that's... Oh, I'm going to have to close that. Okay, so um, quickly just to discuss the politics that sort of um, inhibited the final manifestation of this project. Um, one of the other researchers on uh, Dr. Campbell's team won a bid, a million dollar bid from the Nova Scotia government to go into these tailing sites and do bioremediation um, using silica. And so that meant that that project uh, immediately took precedence over any other interventions um, on the site. Now, the, it was a, an ethical conflict for me, um, mainly because the Nova Scotia government was not uh, necessarily interested in bioremediating the site, um, you know, to restore it to some kind of, you know, um, productive state but so that they could go back in and remine uh, the original ore once it was no longer toxic because it still contained up to 40% of the gold from the original um, ore. So that was that project. The next project I'll talk about is called Salivam. And what you see here is one of the end products of 10 months of collaborative research with microbiologist Denis Quolo, who is a tier one Canada research chair in microorganisms and industrial processes at the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec. And while I explain um, the product, the play, the uh, premise of the project and the other outcomes, um, I'll play a couple of videos that have no audio, uh, starting with this two minute speed through of about six months of work in the lab with Denis. So I showed up in Denis' lab with a few tubes of soil samples from uh, an historically contaminated site, which was the old leather tanning village uh, that was, you know, the first inklings of what's now called Montreal. Um, so the tannery, which is how I'll refer to this village, was a rancid, rank, and festering location where saddles and shoes were produced in fledgling New France. And the soil would be saturated with all sorts of spill off from the tanning process, which at the time would have been done with human urine, as well as dog and pigeon feces in this fermenting brew of microbial wonder, uh, an enzymatic soup. So I was interested in culturing the soil to see what microbes might show up in a Petri dish. And in particular, I was interested in microbes that would break down collagen. So the leather tannery site was a good starting place. And we also concurrently cultured my saliva. And both cultures were done on collagen substrates. Um, they were infused with a plant essence, in this case, blue butterfly, butterfly pea flower that contains anthocyanins, a natural chemical that works well as a pH indicator uh, since it changes from blue to pink in acidic conditions. People like to put it in cocktails. Now, Culturing microbes from the samples on collagen would naturally select for bacterial species that are able to metabolize it. And the cultured microbes from all the samples, both the tannery soil and my saliva, were sent away to a genomics lab for sequencing and identification. And very interestingly, the genetic results showed that both samples, uh, the dirt and the interior of my mouth contained an identical species of microbe called Bacillus cereus. That was the microbe that was isolated on our collagen plates. Um, so it thrives on collagen, it produces a proteolytic enzyme that would metabolize and essentially dissolve collagen proteins. So these are, come on. Twin videos. I'm just going to pause this one and allow the other to catch up. There we go. Um, I produce these as part of a solo exhibition at Sporable Centre en Art Actuel, the artist run center in Sherbrooke that hosted and facilitated the residency and the collaborative research. Um, now, this project, as you will see, has taken on a whole new meaning with the pandemic, but pre pandemic, I was interested in 
queering the beauty industry and in particular that which is built around aging or concepts of aging. Um, hence, I developed a microbial anti-aging cream that was infused with proteolytic enzymes that had been extracted from the microbes that I cultured from my own saliva. And I called the product salivam, which is Latin for saliva. And saliva also, you know, has very interesting relationship to leather curing and tanning. Um, Inuit cultures in particular, uh, possibly others have traditionally chewed on rawhide to soften it. Um, so microbially and zymatically, this works very, very well. So uh, for the most part, I'm gonna stop talking now and allow you to just read the text. Hopefully you can see it, it's a little tiny. Um, but you will see in the text that I was trying to appropriate the language um, that's used in the beauty industry that fetishizes and glamorizes, um, you know, mysterious laboratory processes that happen with white lab coats on in locked rooms. Um, essentially, this, you know, product is saying that, yes, we can have these extracted purified enzymes, or you could just let me lick your face and it would essentially do the same thing. So just another minute for this video. I really should add some audio to this. Trusted among professional artists. I should mention also that this was a successful product. This cream does actually work. You definitely do feel a tingling sensation and it imbues a roseate glow um, to your skin as the enzymes eat away all of the dead surface skin. But it's not for sale. Okay. So just to give you an idea of how this project was presented in the gallery, some of the other interesting outcomes, here are a few installation shots. Um, there was an interactive component with a biosafety cabinet set up with collagen poured into Petri dishes and the microbial enzymes were there in a tube that visitors could use to paint onto the collagen uh, and then come back four or five days later to see etchings that the enzymes produced. And of course um, you have here perhaps the world's first ever uh, intentional uh, microbial enzyme penis graffiti on a petri dish. There were also faces cast in collagen that visitors could rub the anti-aging cream into to see how it would smooth the complexion over time. So this is just a small selection of what was in the exhibition. And I included, of course, um, more scanning electron micrographs of the microbes and the collagen as well. So what you're looking at here is a beautiful ropey textile-like structure of what collagen actually looks like. So the final project I'm gonna talk about um, is a residency project that took place at the KDPCRV Biological Research Station through the Finnish BioArt Society uh, through a residency called Ars Bioarctica. And the goal of my residency project initially uh, was to investigate traditional or indigenous craft-based uses of lichen species that thrive in or are endemic to this distinct subarctic region. And my research was part ethnographic study, part research creation, uh, where video performance was functioning as an embodied method for processing information and integrating learning forming a didactic, didactic uh, artifact. As you've seen all along, this is something that I've used as a strategy in my work frequently. So the ethnographic study was done within the framework of relationship building and building trust by working to engage local community members, the Sami community, um, artists. And I, I began with former students of mine who lived in the Sami village of Inari, um, as well as other craftspeople, researchers, Sami academics and culture workers through a mutually rewarding exchange. And the ethnographic study very much influenced the type of creative outputs produced in what I focused on, what I performed, collected and sought to represent. So for example, um, as you see on the top right here, 
I, I worked to dismantle numerous tourist built and lichen covered stone carns on the sacred Sami site of Sana Fell. This is a federally managed ecosystem in Kirupisyarvi and it's a site of contention between the Finnish government and the Sami. And the voices of you know, the individuals contributed not only to a variety of factual living knowledges, as well as highlighted knowledge gaps, but also provided valuable input on a critical issue that directly impacted my research capabilities. So lichen or in Finnish yakkala, I discovered is an extremely complex socio-cultural entity that re represents much more than a simple material among finno scandic indigenous peoples. It's also the primary source of nourishment for reindeer. Uh, you know, reindeer are the central cultural signifiers of Sami identity. They're used as food, material to construct cultural objects, as well as being one of the main forms that's represented in those objects. So this cultural, material, spiritual entanglement goes back over 10,000 years. Um, and I quickly learned that the research station uh, managed by Helsinki University, where I was in residence, had been a conflict zone for about a decade. And this was a conflict that was instigated by differing views on ecological conservation between the station biologists and the Sami, uh, with the most problematic outcomes being um, dissemination of research by the station and the ideas that represented fueling racism towards the Sami, including you know, regions in the South where there's very little knowledge of the lived experiences of the North. <clears throat> so, um, you know, specifically, there were attempts to use the research to shape public policy to restrict reindeer herding as reindeer were perceived by the station biologists to be too plentiful, destructive on an ever narrowing natural habitat. Uh, but the shrinking habitat is as usual due to human encroachment, such as mining, forestry, tourism, and border control. Um, and as an example, while I was there, a new condo development was placed directly on a migratory reindeer calving grounds displacing vulnerable birthing reindeer and their calves. And, you know, one of the results you're seeing right here in this looping video. So I was concerned that this conflict would undermine my research methodology, the relationship building. <clears throat> By reflecting negatively on me as a researcher affiliated with the station. And I, you know, part of my work became uh, examining my own complicity in an organized organizational mandate that disputes indigenous rights and land claims. And part of my work as a bioartist has been to directly confront well-established museological approaches to living systems, as well as you know, refuse to commodify um, living art outputs for market interests. And based on those experiences, I understood that a museological and market interested approach to ecology that was promoted by the Kilpisyarvi Biological Research Station was in conflict with Sami cultural values, uh, lived experiences of sustainable land use, and ultimately their human rights. And uh, finally, it was with this understanding that I began to think about what I'm ref I refer to as white ecology, um, something we've all been talking about this weekend. And white ecology is not a new framework, but I've only seen it in one scholarly reference um, you know, in the context of black ecology uh, in a journal article from the 1970s that states, quote, blacks and their environmental interests have been so blatantly omitted that blacks and the ecology movement currently stand in contradiction to each other. And I find that, you know, nothing has changed in that regard, really. Um, so, you know, in studying human groups and their relationship to their environments, white interests, particularly where they support industry in those environments, have and continue to take precedence. And white ecology encompasses academic and private sector research that represents a conflict of interest or a problematic of stakeholder interest. Now, what I experienced is that white ecology uh, uses the inarguable excuse of biodiversity and conservation to work towards controlling, but at the same time securing industrial resource extraction in special land parcels that do not conflict with their protected areas, while disenfranchising indigenous cultural rights, which includes access to those resources and areas. So in the case of Kirupisyarvi, 
uh, access to those resources necessarily included protected areas, which were Sami sites, um, sacred sites, but because of industry, um, you know, as well as nationalistic political borders, Sami were prevented from herding in their traditional territories and the reindeer naturally went where they could in search of food. What I also experienced was that white ecology also gaslights uh, indigenous peoples as stewards of the land to you know, exclude them from commercial endeavors stemming from their traditional livelihoods, mainly carried out towards food, food sustainability and community profit. So you know, what I'm calling white ecology embraces an outdated view of nature as something that can be compartmentalized, quantified and managed, and of course, this stems from colonial industrial perspectives of land use, something we've been talking about all weekend. Um, so yeah, um, I guess I'll mention that white ecology also disenfranchises white people. Uh, so I'm not talking about people against people, although I did see that occur um, so much as I'm talking about a system of oppression. And if you want to find out more about my laboratory-based research, which is specifically um, in right now tissue engineering using menstrual fluid at the intersection of witchcraft, you can check it out on my website. So with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you so much for listening. Nice work, really, really. Um so many things in there. I really appreciate your talk so much, White Feather. Um, and we do have some time for some questions. So please, everybody, put your questions in the chat. Um, we do have some coming up. I'm gonna I'm gonna hog the floor and ask you a couple, if that's okay, because I I, I have so many things I want to talk to you about around this. But just for clarification, I want to take us back to the. Um, and I'm not sure if it's called the Perspective Futures or the Oriella Project. But in that, when you were showing, so correct me and when you answer this, um, you were showing some lab work in a, in a uh, laminar hood of some kind where you were extracting some fluids and then taking some samples, soil samples and putting them into these, these pouches. Um, and can you just unpack a little bit what that whole process was for us in terms of then taking those pouches to the water, planting it, and the resulting plants. Just a, just a teeny bit of kind yeah. of walking yeah. us through that, because I think it's fascinating, the combination of the lab practices, you know, very sterile lab practices with all the plastic and everything that goes with it, with these, these very um, uh, amazing rituals, and, and also other materials you're using, such as, um, I don't know if those were leather parcels, but um, yarn I could identify anyway, so these things. So that's great, a great combination. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those were cloth bundles uh, and yarn that I had dyed with uh, some of the goldenrod plants that Brittany Hill was working with. So that gives them their golden color. They were modeled after um, indigenous prayer bundles, um, which are, you know, offerings typically given to elders uh, in exchange for knowledge, presence, uh, et cetera. Now, what I was doing before I got to that point was um, simultaneously culturing the Capriovidus metallodurans in the lab in a liquid culture. Um, as well as collecting soil samples from these contaminated sites and examining them uh, and culturing them as well to see what microbes might be present. And I discovered that they were completely sterile. There were no microbes present. So then uh, the experiments involved inoculating the soil with the Capriovidus metallodurans liquid culture. That's what you see me doing with the dropper to see if they could grow and thrive in that soil and you know, uh, very joyfully discovered that they could. Um, so, you know, that, that whole sequence of experiments were, you know, what we would consider successful. Um, but then uh, those inoculated prayer bundles, I still have with me in a container <laughs> in my fridge with my fruits and vegetables. Um, and then there were, you know, uh, fake bundles, um, prayer bundles that were sort of put in the site. Yeah, I'm sorry that work was just was not able to continue. I hope you get to do it sometime. 
Um, and then I also, there are some questions coming up around the last project that you talked about and um, the trouble with uh, Jakala. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. The Kilpis Jarvi. Jakala. Jakala, thank you. And the Kil Kilpis Jarvi uh, biostation site and also the Sami people. Um, the, if you could unpack for us a little bit, these some of the ideas that you put forward in terms of your own confrontation of museological values versus the Sami values. And then also someone also asked a question about sort of white ecological gaslighting and they wanted you to kind of expound on that a bit. I think these are really important issues to think about and to think through. And I have been to the same uh, bio station you're talking about. And the thing that's quite interesting to me about the site is that, and learning about the Sami people there is that it is a convergence of three different countries of Sweden, Norway, and Finland, where the borders and the kind of compl complications of bordering has also hindered the Sami from doing their reindeer herding as they would like to. So, you know, my, my compliments in looking into this issue. Yeah, this was a very, this was a very difficult time for me. Um, you know, I had gone with kind of romanticized ideas about how lichen sort of intersected, you know, culturally. And it was only sort of two weeks into the residency and, you know, digging into the, all of my research materials, archival um, interviews, et cetera that you know, I discovered that um, the director of the research station was very much pro um, you know, putting up more fencing to keep reindeer out of parcels of land. And you know, I do believe that this was coming from a sincere place where you know, ecological conservation was you know, seen as a, a net positive. Um, however, the communication had just completely broken down between the station biologists and the Sami community. And I consulted with, you know, um, like Sami council leaders about these issues. And I never want to speak on behalf of another cultural group, um, but I was encouraged to do so uh, by the different cultural leaders who I encountered and I think that's probably because they had just reached an impasse. They had reached a point where they felt like white people, you know, white people, um, they were not considered white people, even though their skin is white uh, by a lot of the Finnish population. Um, so they felt they were not listened to and, you know, they were hoping that through, you know, how this project turned out, I would be able to kind of instigate a conversation and I use the term white ecology because, I mean, there are lots of names for this very thing right now. And we've seen a lot of frameworks being, um, you know, brought up by different speakers over the weekend. But I like this because it's a term that's coming from the community that uh, is addressing this from a non-white perspective. And it goes all the way back to the 70s, which is sort of, you know, when the ecological movement really first started to gain steam. And so we can see that this conversation, attempts at this conversation um, have been happening since the seventies, maybe even sooner, but this was sort of the earliest reference that I have seen for this sort of thing. So, you know, um, I find it to be a very straightforward term, I guess, and, and a good way to kind of look at my own implicit role in all of these interactions. I hope that answered your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a complicated um, discussion and, and we can continue it in the group discussion. So thanks. And I think Brandon wants to ask a question too. Thank you so thanks, much, Kevin. White Feather, for this in incredibly compelling and important uh, talk that you shared. I'm wondering if you could share with us uh, what we see really in all of your work, um, which is um, the strategies you use in your artistic practice to balance lab work in this isolated, pure space with uh, your relational methodologies of, of dialogue with the indigenous voices from land. Why is that so critically important? And what strategies do you approach as an artist to keep that always in balance? Um, 
so first of all, uh, one of the problematics that I find in working in a laboratory-based practice, um, you know, and I've been thinking a lot about what Max talked about with replicating, uh, you know, these structures um, in the work. One of the problematics that I find a lot and that I like to address is the inherent uh, solutionism that is, you know, within lab-based work. Um, I like to kind of address this from an anti-capitalist perspective, you know, where my outcomes for my lab work are not meant to be innovations. Uh, they're not meant to be um, industrially scalable uh, solutions to ecological problems, um, because I, I don't think that any solution can be that simplistic without you know, all of these multiple simultaneous and often conflicting truths intersecting and dialoguing and you know, consulting with all of the, to use you know, business language, stakeholders. And those stakeholders necessarily need to include all of the community members who are impacted. That includes indigenous communities. That also includes um, you know, settler communities. So those conversations are of utmost importance to me, um, much more so than uh, coming up with a solution to an ecological problem. I'm really wary of getting caught in that sort of trap. And it's, it's a problematic that I see amplified in the scientific community. I see it amplified in the, the bio art and the bio design community. So, you know, I'm, I'm really focused on that. And in terms of getting out from the lab, um, enacting those rituals, con consciously enacting those rituals and performances for an audience, I like to take it out into the landscape as well and, you know, experience a grounding, uh, in terms of, you know, witchcraft language, a grounding experience um, with interacting with all of the agents and elements uh, and species that are around me so that my knowledge is not just based on what I'm working on within a controlled, confined, sterile environment. Um, I can see all of these interactions and that allows for, you know, fostering a sensibility where I'm allowing for all of the communal human interactions as well versus seeing the world in this compartmentalized uh, perspective. Thank you. And we have a, a question um, from Gabriella. Gabriella, I can't read your whole last name, but if you would like to speak up, that'd be great. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you, White Feather. That was really um, fantastic and interesting. Um, I have a, a question similar to what Brenda just asked, but a bit more practical. So I'm curious to know um, how you kind of navigated moving through the art space to the science space. Because if I read your bio correctly, it seems like you started in the latter and, and ended up in the former. Um, and you know, as a as a new student of science and technology studies, I'm reading a lot of um, scientists who are now kind of leaning more into the humanities and critiquing critiquing science. And a kind of a larger question that I have is um, if, in order to create um, meaningful work in this space, do you really need to be? Do you need to have a foot in both of those worlds, or is it okay to just be in one or the other? So um, I'm just curious to know, you know, more about how you have dealt with that in your career and your practice? Yeah, thanks for that question. I, I really do strongly believe that it's important to have a foot in both. Um, <clears throat> I feel like uh, we can't perhaps, um, you know, I'm gonna say adequately for lack of a better term, but I feel like we can't adequately philosophize about um, you know the issues that we're all talking about here without some kind of rooted, grounded, practical um, understanding of you know not only the processes but also the structures, the power structures um, that are in place. And you know, for me, moving from an artistic background into the scientific realm has 
occurred through a series of stages where, you know, first I started out collaborating with other scientists and the scientists themselves have been fantastic people, curious, creative, welcoming, generous with their knowledge. Uh, it's been the power hierarchies within the institutions and the structures that have been much more difficult to navigate. And so that has, you know, necessitated me kind of more formally moving into the scientific realm in order to uh, find deviant pathways um, around those structures and access into them, um, you know, while also appreciating the need for some of the structures that are in place while also critiquing other structures that are supposedly objective, but completely subjective, I have found. So, you know, it's looking at those subjective kind of roadblocks that inhibit research that both artists and scientists want to do and inhibit scientists as well, um, that I'm really interested in dismantling. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that great question, Gabriella. And thank you to you too, White Feather. Again, I think that we um, are sort of running out of time. So um, I will look forward to a continuation of this conversation during the group discussion. Uh, there are some other questions in the chat we haven't had a chance to get to. So please uh, check that out. And um, maybe we'll get to talk about some of your witchcraft work too in the group discussion, which is also really great. So a uh, big shout out to you and everyone, please give, thank White Feather for this amazing talk.